Hi everyone, thank you for being here. My name is Ed Bourgeois, and uh, my family is Ganem Gyahaga Mohawk from uh, from Ganawage in near Montreal, and French Canadian, also from near Montreal. I was born in the States, but that's where my people are from. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited to host this, and really excited that you're all here. We have a full room, and that we have the HowlRound family listening in remotely. Uh, we want to start, as we always should, by recognizing that we're on uh, other people's ancestral land here. And as you heard this morning, really well said, and I won't be able to say in the same way, but I'll attempt. We are on the lands of the Atacapa Ishak, Kado, Chirimacha, Choctaw, Uma, Natchez, and Tunica people, and the Petite Nations. We also recognize the Alabama, Biloxi, Poasati, and Ofo people who were pushed into these lands, as a lot of our people were, uh, by the colonizers and found themselves here in what is now Louisiana from their ancestral lands. Thank you for being here. Um, we'll talk a little bit about land acknowledgement when we get to that. It's not as simple as that. <laughs> uh, and I, I Googled last night to find out more and it's very, very complex. Like in a lot of places, it's a very complex history here. Lots of peoples. Um, and it's best for them to tell their stories. So I think we're really blessed that we had that opening session this morning. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I'll leave it at that. We're here to talk about advancing indigenous performance. And uh, I'm gonna, we're gonna do this thing where I switch over here and be my own stage manager. <laughs> while the panel here, and there's an extra seat if anyone needs an extra seat. Uh, and as long as it works for HowlRound, we'll just do it this way. In the sessions that we do uh, with Western Arts Alliance and when we go to APAP and other conferences, we're always going to, thank you more for reminding, always put the chairs in a circle. That's how we like to address each other. And, um, and it's not a classroom. Although I hope you, you do learn a lot in this hour and a half. So uh, advancing, uh, my purpose is uh, we invited panelists to talk about particular areas in this progression, in this evolution that we're all involved in, this movement that, that has a lot of momentum right now. I'm really excited that we hear about indigenous initiatives all over happening. Um, but we want to particularly address what's happening at, at, uh, at Western Arts Alliance and at some other places, some of our allies like First Peoples Fund. Uh, so we're going to talk about Advancing Indigenous Performance, which is, a, which is a particular program at Western Arts Alliance, and how it reaches out into all of our communities. We're going to start with introductions. And we're going to start with Mina. Yeah, just introduce yourself. Oh. <laughs> I thought he was going to say something. Oh, no, no, it sounded no, no. like that. Um, so my name is uh, Mina Natraja, and I am one of the artistic directors and the executive director of Benjo World Theatre uh, in Minneapolis. So I just want to um, speak for people seven. So I um, just want to acknowledge that. So I come from a place where it is um, um, the First Nations are the Dakota, the Dakota people. And um, so that's the, where we, Benjas, you know, lives and works. So it's very privileged to live and work in Dakota land. And also uh, the Ojibwe people came right after the, after the Dakota people uh, to that land. So um, just really privileged to live in a place where there's so many First Nations in the city around us for us to make relationships with and to uh, uh, have, have relations. And Benji is about uh, 25 years old. Uh, uh, we are. Uh, we started our first uh, in 1995, but ever since we came to Minneapolis, and Dipankar is actually the artistic director. Other members of NJ here, Dipankar, Adlin, um, are, are in our staff, and Anne is on, in our board of directors. Mm -hmm. And so ever since we came to uh, uh, start NJ 25 years ago, 
Um, and even before that, we actually, um, um, uh, and I guess I, I just want to tell you a little story about uh, how uh, we started working with, with indigenous mm -hmm. folks. We first, when we first came to Minneapolis, we, um, uh, we were commissioned by the Advocates for Human Rights mm -hmm. uh, to do a piece about immigrants, about immigrant bias. That was the time of Proposition 187. And as we were creating the piece, we created the piece with 30 people from multiple immigrant communities and with multiple languages. But as we started the rehearsals, and immediately we felt there was something not quite right here, that, that we had to have indigenous folks in the space beginning the piece. And um, so uh, we approached uh, an elder who we knew, Paul Sharon Day, uh, who was a medicine woman in uh, um, the Twin Cities, and an elder, and asked her to be part of the piece, and she brought her grandson. And, uh, and, you know, and then that was, that was the beginning of a relationship that really, uh, you know, she started drumming, the, 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 the first piece was, uh, and, and then the immigrants came in after that. Um, so it was really um, beautiful because the Ojibwe was spoken in the space first, and then we had um, other, other languages. And so, and then, uh, you know, we started Pangea, we created our pieces, and then in about uh, two, uh, 2000, uh, we uh, had, a, 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 and also we did that at the American Indian Center. This piece was done at the American Indian Center. And we met with uh, a, da a Dakota woman called Juanita Espinosa, who had her own art gallery. And uh, so we asked Juanita, uh, uh, we said, you know, we really want to uh, uh, support people. Could we, we support, we really work with people from multiple ethnicities. I come from a place, I come from India. And as an immigrant, it's, uh, uh, you know, and, and uh, coming from a particular space and land, I, uh, it, 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 uh, how I grew up was completely pluralistic having multiple languages spoken in the space, having multiple sp the foods, you know, multiple. This is, this is what, I, what, what I love and crave for in my life. And so uh, I, I remember that I asked Juanita, uh, we, the Pankar and I went and talked to Juanita, I looked at, looked at her gallery, she had a little tiny gallery as big as this space, and uh, said, so how can we, what can we do? Uh, you know, we would love to see, we would love to know about a little bit more about Native playwrights. We would love to know a little bit more about directors. And she said, she brought out a book, a bunch of scripts this big, and said, here, these are the people who come to me. This is a gallery, but they bring their scripts to me. And so, uh, that, so that's how we began our relationship with uh, Native artists and started our Indigenous Voices series that we do every single year. Uh, and it's become something that we do all year round now. We, whenever we can, we, we support Native artists. Uh, we have, uh, you know, we also just finished an Indigenous festival this year. Uh, supporting like several, many, many indigenous artists. We might have a few brochures and I'll put it out over there. Uh, but that's how we really began our Indigenous Voices series and, and really learned by making mistakes and <laughs> doing lots of, like, lots of foolish things probably. And, uh, but, but, uh, you know, but really acknowledging that this was indigenous land and that, that we needed to work and live on, that we needed to respect and uh, do that work while being completely aware that we were on indigenous land. And uh, so our relationship with Sharon, and also really like figuring out, okay, but if we're doing this work, we need to have people on our board who are indigenous. So uh, Sharon Day, for example, is on our board of directors right now. Uh, and then, and I, then I became, um, I, I mean, it's not linear, you know, you learn as you go along, you learn lots about the community that you're part of and uh, how important that is. Um, and then um, and every time, uh, for us, how we enter into a community and how we, uh, uh, that is very, very important. So protocol is important as part, uh, somebody who's from a different country, you know, protocol is so important. How you come into a space is so important. How you enter a space is so important. And it's really about respect. Um, and so I have been on the NPN board for about six years. And I was also part of the partnership committee on the NPN board. And so one of the things that struck me immediately, and I'm always looking around and seeing who's missing at the table. Mm -hmm. Like, who, who's not there? It's like, and who should be there at the table? And one of the things that very early on noticed that there were no, hardly any Arab Americans at mm -hmm. the conferences and hardly any Native uh, Indigenous people at the conferences. And so we really began to search for like what, uh, how, how um, you know, like how can we bring more Indigenous folks to the conference? Uh, to the NPM conference, but also how can we also bring along a partner who's also indigenous who would then commission indigenous artists. And I, we made it a point that every year that once we became NPM partners that at least one commission would go to an indigenous artist so that they can then become part of the network. That's how NPM worked in those days. It was like you had to become a part of the network and then you would be invited into the conference. So we would at least work with one so that then they would be invited to the conference uh, per year. You know, and that's all we could afford at that time. 
And I remember uh, very early on in the partnership process um, uh, suggesting that NAPD should be, uh, the All My Relations Gallery should be part of that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, I, I mean, I nominated them for the, and now they're partners of LNP, so I'm so <laughs> proud that that's, that's fantastic that they are. And we work very closely with NACD. Um, in fact, we did a uh, conversation this year together for our Indigenous Festival. Um, so, I, and so for us, it's a how do you build the relationship and how do you deepen it at every point and how do you learn from the mistakes you make and what will you do to, um, uh, and how, how do you then go back and say, okay, this was a mistake, but then how could we, how can we repair that, mm -hmm. and how can we make it better? And, and uh, you know, because as human beings, we're flawed creatures. We make mistakes, you know. But if you come from that basic respect, that, uh, uh, th that that's what's important. And ever since then, we've also had the privilege. I mean, the extraordinary privilege of hosting um, this thing called the National Institute for Directing and Ensemble Creation. Uh, which is every um, uh, uh, which we started in 2012, supporting people of color and women directors, and um, it's it's uh, an exchange, it's a peer exchange, and it's directors who are usually uh, uh, invited to this thing. Uh, but in 20, uh, I, I, we worked with Keita Sullivan of um, NIFA and um, Laurie Purier of First Peoples Fund, um, and asked them to suggest native artists. So, so we wanted to host an indigenous gathering, and we thought it would be a small indigenous gathering of artists prior to the big peer exchange that we would invite every other, you know, like all the other immigrant and uh, people of color artists too, and women and women directors and so on and so forth. And what happened then was we worked with Peter and uh, Laurie and we were on the phone with them and they kept suggesting names. And then what happened was when, they, when we started inviting people, they said, but you can't do this without this artist and you can't do that without that artist. So it became like a, 35, a list of 35 people. So then we, we kind of like, I guess, understood the need. And so we said, okay, let's put off the peer exchange and do the indigenous gathering. So we had 35 people that year for an indigenous gathering in Pangea. And we made plenty of mistakes, believe me. Uh, we, because of the way it was done, and we didn't know who we were inviting, we did not invite as many local artists as we would have liked. Mm -hmm. And that was a huge mistake that we had to repair over, <laughs> over the next few years. But you know, that, but that's how you learn, right? Because we, we were initially invited two or three local artists, but then it became 35 artists from outside. Mm -hmm. We couldn't, I mean, that was, that, that was not, that was not okay. We had we needed more local artists. We also included Sharon Day in that uh, curating process, a, a local uh, elder who's also on our board of directors. Uh, Sharon also was part of the curating team of bringing artists in. And that's part of what, how we do it. We have people from that community curating. And so that's, uh, I, I don't want to talk a lot, but we can talk a little more as the questions unfold. But our directing institute since then, that first, it, there was so much hunger, there was so much, I, Ed was there, um, and uh, there was so much hunger, there was so much like, oh my God, this is the first time we're all getting together in a room that ever since then, prior to our institutes, we've always had a gathering of the direct, indigenous directors who are part, so that they can name, they can say, this is what's missing from our field for ourselves, this is what we want to see in the field, and we kind of say, okay, we want to open the space up, but we want to leave the room. We, we're open to leaving the room if you need to just be by yourself. And uh, we'll just support from the outside. And, and what does that mean, right? Um, I'm not fond of the word ally because it, to me it just sounds very military, but I, I think co-conspirator or, uh, you know, just like uh, accomplice. Um, <laughs> accomplice is a lovely word, yeah, things like that is, is a much better word uh, for me. And for me, I think that for, uh, it, it's like, and I feel like, how do you develop a deep reciprocal relationship? And we've also worked with, uh, and, and now we, in now in, uh, right now in our institute, so we've worked for 20 years, and, and right now, and it's like, you know, I feel like I, I hate, I, uh, I, it sounds like boasting, but you know, the truth is, this is the work that we all should be doing. Mm -hmm. Every single one of us should be doing this work, right? And so it's not like brave work, or it's not, it's just the work that needs to happen when you want to bring people who are different from you in a room and also to acknowledge the land you're on. Um, and uh, what else? I mean, I feel like the thing, one, the one thing I would um, uh, like to say is um, that um, uh, I, I feel very proud. I, I, well, so right now, our indigenous program, we, so right now we have uh, uh, the institute, but we also, this, this last year, started working with um, uh, 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 we've started uh, two direct directing fellowships at NGO that will go on for two years each. And so we're working with um, an indigenous artist who's a directing fellow who is the Pankar's mentee. 
um, and I mean, ask the pulpit to be his mentor, right? So, that, uh, so it's like a request. And, uh, but who's also becoming an awesome, amazing director in his own right, directing a complete youth program for the last eight years, but really learning the techniques of directing in a totally different way, and also a Palestinian-American director who's our mentee right now. So, uh, so we have like two uh, directing, director, directing, directing fellows who have been trained and who will attend the directing institute have the privilege of having 35 amazing artists to work, you know, to learn from as well. I mean, I feel like that's tr trying to decolonize even our ways of learning what our aesthetics mm -hmm. are, you know, and one of the things, it's just amazing to hear Kirby, who's our directing fellow, say, you know, I'm really learning uh, this directing technique because, you know, I think it's because of the power that I want to do this thing in a circle and I want to, you know, so really invoking those kinds of aesthetics that are important and deeply culturally rooted from that community. And for me, that's uh, rewarding, really, to, to hear that, that oh, I, you know, I come from that, that base and then I'm going to do this thing. So I'm just going to stop speaking now. <laughs> well, you bring up great points, and we'll circle back to mm -hmm. some of them. Next is, please come in. We'll make room on the floor. This happened in New York, too. It's a great problem to have. It is. We need a bigger room next time. So next is, uh, come on in. We'll make room. Next is Asia. Asia Mai. My name is Asia Freeman. I'm um, a long-term guest on Denaina and Sukyak land in South Central Alaska. It's about uh, 200 miles south of Anchorage as the crow flies on um, Ketchumak Bay um, in the Tukatnu watershed, as the Denaina call it. I am the artistic director of Benell Street Art Center, which um, is a uh, a building shipped up from the Pacific Northwest of non-indigenous wood and erected on the shore of um, what the white settlers call Bishop's Speech. Its name um, to that was resurrected by Emily Johnson to our um, leadership at Bunnell. And that represents exactly this process of transformation that's been invoked by artists and is transforming the organization. It's a process of like listening and responding to what artists, especially artists in Alaska, need for support. You know, when Emily comes home, we're the closest space, I think, place where she can connect with her, um, <coughs> her stories, and the stories of the land and, and her family stories. And although she's Yupik and her relatives are from farther north, the story of displacement is as true in Alaska as it is anywhere else. So at Benel, um, we we do a few things: um, exhibits, um, residencies, and, and education through artists and schools. And through that, of course, we engage residency artists that come from all over. Um, I think of our space because it's a 32 by 64 foot cedar and fir, originally a hardware store with a boarding house upstairs. Not very large, but really. Um, really great for exhibits and intimate residencies where um, people can workshop and develop um, in that kind of warm wooden space that has good acoustics, it has nice light, it's close to the beach, you can go outside and yell for a few minutes and get some fresh air and run, maybe you have your dog with you, it's ideal. Um, and then come back and sit by the stove and then go downstairs and move around and do these things that, you know, we need to do when we're making work. So it's, a, it's definitely more of an incubator space than that final kind of big, um, important, more um, spacious venue with lots of comfortable seats. But we really do um, draw the community in for the artists and for the community through things like potluck, which always start out the residency process, and maybe some workshops along the way, and sharings and more eating together that conclude that process. But um, very importantly, land acknowledgement begins those residencies. And it really um, happens in answer to what artists, what artists want. And I think that's something that um, we've learned, you know, 
we've learned from artists is to, to say, when you come to this space and you come to this land, what do you need to make your, your work? And in meaningful relationships, permission to be on that land and to connect with the people um, who have been the you know, stewards of that land from time immemorial is a primary objective so gathering um, with the um, indigenous folks who are, who are all invited, who choose to attend, who bring food to share, and um, stories and experiences and invitations that get these artists out into the land and into the community is really seminal to the creation of authentic work. And so fundamentally um, respecting those opportunities and then um, holding that space <coughs> is what we're doing. Okay, thank you. And we'll, we'll come back to examples of exactly what they're talking about. So next is Mara Garcia. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Um, my name is Moira Garcia. I'm a dancer and a choreographer. I'm Cherokee and Madame Mesquite. Um, I'm originally from North Carolina and I grew up not in Cherokee or Madame Mesquite homeland, but in uh, Okanichi and Saponi homeland in the middle of North Carolina. And um, I now live in Lawrence, Kansas, and uh, Kansa, or Ka, homeland. Um, let's <coughs> see. I, I, so I'm, like I said, I'm a dancer and a choreographer. <coughs> I'm the artistic director of Nora Garcia Dance. I, may, I create uh, contemporary indigenous dance. Um, and a lot of my work has to do with uh, the stories of my, of my tribal people, the stories of you know, family stories personal stories, uh, traditions, and the movement and actions that come with work and daily life. Um, and I am here today because I'm also a member of the Indigenous Roadshow Ensemble, which is a new show that uh, we are just at the beginning of creating and we're able to create at the Bunal Artist Residency Program, so at the Art Center, and we just uh, left not so long ago, less than two weeks, home or Alaska. <laughs> so it's very fresh in my mind. Um, and I guess I won't, s I'll wait till later to save my other things. So, yeah. Thank you. And next is Erin. Hi, uh, my name is Erin Boberg Doughton. I'm one of the artistic directors of PICA, the Portland Institute for Contemporary Art. And we're on the land of the Chinook. Multnomah, Clackamas, and many other indigenous people in Portland. Um, my family is um, from Norway and Sweden and um, settled on that land several generations ago in the Tualatin Valley. Um, and I'm, that's very close to Portland too. Um, and I, I'm reminded, um, listening to everything you said, that um, we at PICA and me as an individual, we're um, really uh, at the beginning of a process of, of this work and want to acknowledge and um, respect all of the people who have been doing this work um, for a long time, both the indigenous people and culture bearers in our, our land um, and also um, all of the artists and the culture workers we've we've met um, through this process. So I'll talk more later about kind of where we are as an organization and where um, we hope to be in the future. Um, yeah. Thank you. For now. And last is me, and I already introduced myself. I'm Ed. If you came in late, um, what? We started off with Men what Menace began to address <coughs> is the question that for uh, for me in my professional career was the instigator of 
what we're what we're doing together now. And that was that I've known Mina and DePunker for many years since I was invited to but before that somehow. Part of DevOps maybe? I don't know. We've known each other for a long mm -hmm. time. And We've been to an institute. Yeah. And uh, Mina was on the board of, of NPN at that time and came back from meetings and told us that this is what this is one of the questions that the board discussed. Where are all the indigenous touring artists? So that has led to uh, <coughs> there, are a lot of, there are a lot of organizations doing work at the same time and beginning to uplift. Uh, for me, this is what started it. It was really in the conversation about NPM. And one of those other conversations led to, at Western Arts Alliance, the development, the, the, the grant writing and seeking of funding and then getting the funding to start a program that, that was named, that started last year, 2018, Advancing Indigenous Performance. The components of that, just so, uh, so you all know as artists, there are a lot of artists here who are in a cohort of the First Peoples Fund Performing Arts Artist Cohort, um, that there are resources. Yeah, raise your hand. Raise your hand. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, uh, and, and meeting you for the first time, I know a lot of your names because uh, a lot of the indigenous artists are applying for similar things around. And yet, and yet we don't know who everybody is yet. You know, it's like we're just in the beginning and we're just, Every time we have an application, more and more people apply, which is what we want. Um, and we'll be going to <coughs> other regions where we're not getting a lot of, we're not currently getting a lot of applications and trying to disseminate more information and work with the regional arts organizations or, or, or however that happens to provide more uh, education or, or more just information about the opportunities that exist for the native artists in that area. So some of the th some these are some of the areas that uh, that we address at Western Arts Alliance in this advancing indigenous performance program. One is called the Native Launch Pad. Uh, and what this is is a three year fellowship. We have a native we have a couple native launch pad artists in the room. One is Christopher was in the is the twenty eighteen cohort. And Mora in the in the, the current cohort. And it's a significant three year investment in an artist's career. And there's a monetary award, there is mentorship. So we seek with the artist's input, we seek a, a mentor that will really help them find the develop the tools that they need to truly launch into the, the presenting field as touring artists. Uh, it includes membership in WA, membership in APAP, travel to those conferences, uh, and, and, and many other opportunities for, for networking, which is really the, for a lot of artists, that's, that's the next thing that they need. You've got a lot of the tools for your discipline. Some of you may need things like you know, a music video or some kind of technical element or a really great website. But for a lot of artists who are at this place, it's really about how do I get into those, how do I meet the right people who might want this kind of work in their, in their organization. So a lot of it's about getting them into the networking opportunities. Um, we have a lot more applicants than we have launch pad places, awards. So uh, each year we take about 10 folks who didn't get the, the launch pad award and make them fellows. And what they get for that is the opportunity to come to the, the WA, the Western Arts Alliance conference, and begin to do that networking. And also some year round, um, we try to do year round career, we try not to say professional development. <laughs> um, it's, again, there are so many things you'll find in these conversations. What are, what are microaggressions for people? Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and the terminology professional in the Western and artistic sense can, 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 you know, we don't think about that necessarily, but we call it career development. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have an ongoing um, year-round program for, for webinars and different things that uh, conference calls, we stay in touch. And the same thing that the, F the First Peoples Fund people are doing, right? You have similar kinds of things because there's a real power in that bond in, in what the cohort does together as peers. 
We have a, an artist travel assistance fund grant, and this is uh, in the, the, the first applications that we've taken, uh, we get a lot of applicants that don't really, uh, it doesn't, that don't qualify, because it's a very specific grant. This is not for touring. This is to assist with the expenses of getting to conferences where you're going to network and where you're going to meet presenters. It can be a showcase opportunity or even just attending a conference you know, that you think will be valuable for your career. Uh, in, the, in the current round, we have three people that are coming to the, uh, the Folk Alliance International, the International Folk Alliance Conference that's going to happen here in New Orleans. There's another one called the Touring Fund. And these are, this is important for you if you tour as a, an indigenous artist. This is a grant that matches presenter grants that are made by the regional arts organizations. So if you're in the West, for instance, and you have a presenter that wants, that's thinking about bringing you, they would apply for a West Staff grant or a NIFA grant or a South Arts grant in, in the regional arts organization. And we've asked them to, to all qualify, to have a place where you can check off, or the presenter would check off that yes, we are bringing in an indigenous artist. And if that's the case, and you meet the qualifications of being a you know, citizen or, or permanent resident, or, you know, what we, what we consider in our category, then we match that funding. So it's an opportunity. So as artists, you can let them know, you know, you can get two for one money through WA if you, if you bring it. You know, you just apply for that grant. And if it's, you know, they can only apply for so many a year. But if you're one of the artists that they want to support, then they can double them up to double. Uh, we had so much, so many applicants. There were so many indigenous artists in, in Arts Midwest and in, um, in West Staff that we weren't actually able to match dollar for dollar. We had to make it about 50% because mm -hmm. there were so many. And that's really good news for us. Mm -hmm. So the year-round career development has to do with a lot of uh, webinars. We did about four or five webinars last year based on what does the cohort need. You know, we need to know about taxes, or we need to know about how to make a budget, or we need to know about scenography. You know, we've done those kinds of webinars. And we should, um, Amber, we should coordinate on how we can get all of your fellows in on those calls, because it's not just open to our awardees, it's open to any indigenous artist. Uh, and then uh, we're developing uh, some of this work I brought with me from my previous job. I was working in Hawaii with uh, Vicky Takamine at Kaiyi Foundation. So some of these, the, the Native Artist Residency idea kind of, kind of began developing there. And we wrote, wrote the grant while I was still there and it's carrying over to where I am now at Western Arts Alliance. But Native Artist Residencies has NEA funding in, uh, in the first year. It, uh, they like the idea. And, um, and it really was born out of conversations with Native artists like all artists of color that go to residencies and will be the only artist of color there, sometimes, often, happens. And they spend the whole time talking about their culture, you know, educating, educating everyone else rather than doing their work. Mm -hmm. and, and we felt that maybe you know, we started doing some surveys through the mm -hmm. Alliance of Artist Communities and discovered that there are a lot of residencies out there that want to host indigenous artists, really are uncomfortable or feel like they're not completely prepared. And so they are interested in having some help on how to do that in a good way. So that's mm -hmm. what we're trying to, uh, the current residency that, that um, Asia will talk about in a sec is, was the pilot for that. We've, we're filming it, we're documenting, we're trying to build a case for, for a continuing program that will work with Native and, but mostly, I assume, will be non-Native residencies that want to do this work. And then uh, the Indigenous Roadshow we'll talk <coughs> about. This is sort of um, an example of, okay, we can provide tools, we can help provide tools, but what, what do you really want as artists? You want the opportunity, right? You want the opportunity to get out there and do the work. So we, we pitched the idea, proposed to ourselves the idea of the Indigenous Roadshow as an opportunity to give an opportunity to performers to, to devise work and put it out there. And for presenters who, as we said in the beginning, are saying, where are all the, the, the native artists? 
it gives them something that they can look at and consider bringing. There'll be multi, there'll be iterations as we go with this. So this is the pilot that we talked about. So native artist residencies. Um, Agent's going to talk about uh, about the one that we just had, but the the framework for what we pitched to the NEA and and what they funded for this pilot was that we can offer, and this came out of the, the surveying that was done, we've got about 40 partners, residencies that have signed up that want to participate in the network to do this work for, for Native artists. And we offer and can provide, and the pilot is demonstrating, oops, is demonstrating cultural competency training So out of that surveying, that how do we get folks over that discomfort about, someone mentioned protocols, and we'll talk about that. There are some things that can be, can be really scary, you know, that seem confrontational <coughs> and, and aren't. Uh, so what we offer and what we did in, in Alaska was to bring trainers on site before the residency begins, ideally before the residency begins, and to offer cultural competency training for the board and staff and partners of that organization. So that everyone's kind of on the same page about vocabulary and, and, and intention and all of those things. The second is what's really important in, in the surveying that we did is that Native artists need cultural, they need community engagement. Most artists don't want to go to a place and be working solo. You know, I'm sure there are some writers that just want a quiet space and they just want to do their work solo. But what are the stories that you've been sharing with me? It's about you guys getting together, right? And getting in a studio together and making music and, and meeting the people in the community and sharing food. And do so all of these things that, you know, if, if you don't know and you want to know what Native artists need, ask them. But a lot of times they're going to say, we want to, we want to work with youth. We want to find other collaborators in your community. We want to know, we'll learn about your culture. We want to share our culture. We want to share food and experiences, maybe spiritual practice. I mean, there's so many things that, that, that make, can make a residency really great for, for a Native artist. And those are the things that we want to explore. So Deja will also talk about how we do that in Alaska. And then the actual residency. You know, uh, we'll do a sort of a, a an assessment of all these all the partners, what they can offer. You know, if you need to do welding, and then we need to find the right partners that can accommodate that. If you need to just be outdoors in a beautiful place, we've got lots of those places too. Um, so we're building that net network as we go. Cultural competency training. I'm just going to race through this. Indigenous Direction is not the only company out there. Um, and that's not how they spell it. They spell it in <laughs> one word. <laughs> uh, there, are, there are plenty of folks out there that do this work, but Indigenous Direction is Larissa. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> it's all was beautiful <coughs> on when, I, when I did it before. So <laughs> forgive, the, forgive the formatting. Larissa Fastforce and Ty Defoe are, are uh, artists themselves and also do this work in a company to do cultural competency training for uh, for companies that want to work with native artists, um, that's awesome. So, do you want to tr start talking about the residency? Uh, this is the training part. Yeah, I'm happy to. But I'd I'd like to back way up sure, a bit and, sure. and sort of come back to that point about how like Vanel Arts is is at um, the sort of confluence or the meeting of of Sufiak and Denina land, and it's a place that. Um, was not immediately really largely populated by indigenous people. And so when, when settlers came to this land, they just sort of claimed it and erected this big hardware store, which was running right up through my childhood, um, and closed sometime in the late 80s, at which point a bunch of artists came into this space, started to rent it, and eventually bought it and said, this would be a great place to have innovative contemporary art. And um, as that organization developed, I would, I would have to say it really was, you know, on a, on a continuum of what we might call, it was introduced to me by Shannon Doubt, former board member of NPN, 
about six years ago, a continuum of becoming an anti-racist, multicultural organization, it would fall in the passive range. You know, you might say at first there's this um, exclusive, and then you have a passive, and then in, in the continuum of becoming more um, anti-racist, you have a symbolic, um, and then an affirming, and finally a structurally changed and transforming, and ultimately a fully um, transformed organization. So Bunnell was really in a passive uh, position, which could be explained by several factors. First of all, the, the um, you know, the silencing and the erasure of history, which might have meant to many people that it was not native land. I mean, when I, I knew that it was because I happened to have a mother who was flying all over Alaska collecting stories of indigenous transition and change working in public radio as a child. So the elders in my home were indigenous Alaskans talking about amazing stories of resilience and survival that had taken place basically in the last 50 to 75 years. They might be speaking from prison. They might be speaking from a really remote um, Arctic community or even a cabin on the shore of Ketchumac Bay where um, in that kind of indigenous diaspora, you know, um, few people were listening for, and, and hardly anybody was gathering stories. And so when I, when I was in elementary school and high school, you had this Alaska Studies course, which seems like it began with first contact, right? It began in the 1600s with the Russian fur trade by the Sparings con conquest, you know? So um, I just remember being in school and then, and then coming home and my mom just said like, bullshit, you know? And, and, but I also knew it because I had been hearing, you know, and so it didn't make, didn't make sense, and, and so at first, as a passive organization, it was like, okay, if we, if we hold this space, um, who might want to come? And how to be, how to be, you know, there are questions about how to be appropriate and inviting and inclusive. When, um, although we have a diverse staff, we didn't have anybody um, of indigenous Alaskan origin on that staff. And, um, but some of the some of the traditions that, that we developed, I think, naturally did invite some people, and that included growing up in potluck tradition, potlucks, and gathering and telling stories. And um, over time, um, because um, especially in the uh, uh, early 90s, late 80s, when Benel emerged, a lot of indigenous artists wanted to be known as you know, good artists, not good native artists. It was an important qualifier for somebody like Ron um, Sanungatuk and Anupiek, um, founder of Alaska Native Art Studies, came to Homer and became one of our advisors, and suggested a variety of different artists who might like to become involved. And very much like Emily uh, Johnson, who happily is here with us today, visual artists too <laughs> presented um, a lot of um, needs and ideas about how we could support and transform. So we, we um, in, you know, as an organization that is interested in transformation, which to me is just like living and being relevant and being alive as an organization, and it's about growing and not just reflecting, but actually participating in the transformation of artists themselves. And I say that as a creative person who doesn't want to just show up to an administrative job, but really live and grow and change through that work. Um, we sought um, funding and began to think about um, the, the work of land recognition. And so behind the idea and the possibility of becoming a place where residencies could happen, we found a local funder. You know, you have those regional funders all around the country. Many of them supported art place in specific <coughs> regions. In Alaska, Rackison Foundation has been exemplary. And in, a, in an, a grant application to them last year, I said, Fidel wants to engage in transformational work around land acknowledgement, which happens through both permanent and ephemeral installations that will take place in this land. And that helped us to have funds for commissioning artists like Emily Johnson and Catalyst, like the Indigenous Roadshow, 
um, like visual artists who are currently exhibiting so that we from an administrative and um, uh, funding standpoint ourselves can put forward funds to make these things happen. So I believe that if you step up and say, we want to be part of this transformational work as an organization and seek funding for land acknowledgement through um, ephemeral and permanent installation. And I say that because some funders are thinking about capital all the time. But when you remind them that some works are ephemeral and they're very important, and those include stories and dances and music, and others will make sculptures and make installation, but to, but to remind funders, too, of that continuum within which artists create. So that has been very helpful, and that's made it possible for us to be that kind of space then that could, that could raise our hand and say, yes, we'd love to host, and we're a good place. Um, for artists to come, yes, we're isolated, you know, we're like, if you wanted to get, if you wanted to leave here today, you would get there, you know, tomorrow night. <laughs> but it's, if you want to go and you want to work quietly or, or just closely with the land and with, with in, the, in that, with each other, that's a great, that's not too far. And eat fish. You need a lot of <laughs> so the um, the training was we held a training with yeah. uh, Ty. Uh, Larissa wasn't able to make it at the last minute, but Ty uh, did a really great training. Uh, I'll say a little bit more yeah. about that. You probably sure. wanted me to look at the training. So cultural competency was one of the things that we asked for support from um, with from Rasmussen Foundation, and we. Um, we invited all of our community collaborators. So we invited the Public Radio, the Local Resilience Coalition, the College, um, the Arts Council, the Pratt Museum, um, representatives <coughs> of local tribes to train with us in learning and practicing and thinking about and unpacking cultural competency. We shared with them statistics which show that 95 some percent of organizations that might want to have Native artists residencies actually feel a little bit insecure about how to do that properly. And they all said, yeah. And they might have a different idea about what a Native artist residency is at a public radio station or at a museum or um, through a health-oriented resilience coalition, but, but at least they all felt it relevant. And so we found that there was additional funding by making it open to the whole community. And then this is where I realized, okay, we're in another stage as an organization. Let me go back to my little book here. We are not passive anymore or symbolically changing, but we are engaged in structural transformation because we want to change the conversation to look at settler colonialism and address the impacts of colonization. We want to change the language that we, with our community partners, are engaging in and um, inviting uh, to, to be more expansive and acknowledging of indigenous names, stories, artists, groups, practices. So it's, it's very interesting. And it's we discovered, I mean, simple little things like in that training, that we discovered it was sort of like there was a group realization around the fact that across the street from Benel there's a fence where somewhere well, a local restaurant put up a banner and it's you know one of these sort of patriotic uh, let's thank our veterans and our pioneers and our native people or something. No, 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 it just said veterans. That's the point. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it yeah. didn't say it right. That's right. <laughs> but, yeah, but. There was, there was no realization in the community that the word pioneers is really, really charged too. Mm -hmm. And Alaska is, is called the last frontier by a lot of people. You know, there's, there's such a, an embedded mentality of that being a place where no one was and it's just a matter of going in and taking it and developing the resources. So uh, it was really, really great work. Ty and Marissa do amazing work. Uh, and these are some of the, uh, they start with people um, going around the room and writing on big pieces of paper, what are their reactions to these words? Mm -hmm. You find that these words are often misunderstood and really highly charged for everybody. Mm -hmm. So it's a really good thing to, uh, 
go through. Then, uh, and then we did uh, the second part, we, we, uh, we did community engagement, and that's something that Asia can talk about. Uh, it, it was a lot of hard work to get that to happen, mm -hmm. but we ended up flying into a little 300 person village in these four seater planes that couldn't fly any other time during the week because of wind. Cool. So, you know, you're like, yeah. and we got one sunny day and we flew right. in to a, a gravel runway where the, with the waves crashing from the ocean. And they come in and they bank and land on one wheel and then to go around the curve and then, and then come down on two wheels. Yeah, it was awesome. <laughs> Are, are starved for visitors, especially visitors like them. <coughs> um, so in, uh, in, in, in the, the framework, again, that we're, we're trying to set up, some of that community engagement has to do with protocol. Um, and maybe you want to talk about how that was done in, in Alaska. Uh, oh, that's an awful picture. <laughs> It doesn't come up very well. But that's Sarah. I kind of like silhouette. Yeah. Um, the, the, it's, it's in the Vanel Gallery, uh, which is the space that's also the rehearsal space. Uh, our director, uh, Peter Rockford Espiritu, who goes by the name Tao, we call him Tao. Uh, he's Hawaiian and Samoan. He came into the, into the residency and basically said, uh, we're not going to start doing any work until we have been welcomed to land. Uh, we're going to have a deeper conversation about, about protocol. Mm. But one of the things that you'll want to know when working with native artists is they're having 500 and some nations, they all have different protocols. Mm -hmm. But they generally have protocols around respecting where they're, where they're standing. And he insisted, right, that um, mm -hmm. we're, we're not going to start working until we've been welcomed to the space. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Asia found elders from the local tribes mm -hmm. uh, to come in. And um, it may not it look like much. It was us sitting in a circle and sharing gifts and songs and prayers and whatever anyone wanted to share. But it was truly meaningful. I don't think that had ever been the people from the local tribe had never had that respect shown to them. You know, that artists come in and just start working and it doesn't matter where they are. But for native artists to come in and, and ask for permission is pretty powerful. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate the fact that these folks who are from the Ninilchik village drive were, were both um, able and willing and so spontaneous. I mean, in fact, I initially started out with the tribe the um, Sukhiak tribe in uh, Nanwalik village across the bay. And I reached out to them, um, you know, just months in advance during a busy time. And at first, probably because they were busy, and then eventually because maybe it sounded like a really kind of serious project, um, it might have been intimidating. And um, I didn't. I didn't get a response, so then I tried through the tribal office of the Nilchik Village Tribe to get elders, and they didn't feel like they had enough time to, to create a proper welcome. Mm -hmm. So then I worked, I reached out to local residents from that tribe who, who in, a, in a more informal fashion, um, I had seen many times and our friends had come into the Benel and I asked if they would, would come, and um, they said yes. And when they got there and saw even just chairs arranged, and they said, well, what will this be like? And I said, well, you know, people are probably going to be in some regalia, and they are going to, are going to ask for permission, and they'll, they'll probably give some gifts, and, and their faces kind of went, you know, like white for a moment, and they're like, we didn't bring anything. And I, I just looked around the vanilla, and I said, well, what do you want to give them? You know, and they, they, and they, they looked around, and then they, they picked a hand-drawn map and some candles, and we just wrap them up right away. So having some things available that could be gifts, knowing that they were going to receive gifts was, was great, and we, we gave it to them. See, what, something I realized is that this village across the bay, as much as it felt good to invite them, is impoverished. They can't afford to send a whole bunch of elders over and charter a plane. I should have said, 
we will bring you over, right? Mm -hmm. But it, there's a constant, like, we're always failing, but I just had to, and then, then I knew we were still gonna go, and, and in fact, I offered them, like, a few, a few days before this event, I said, we will get you, but they were too busy. But it was like, okay, I'm, ah, just pick myself up and try again. I felt so ashamed that I hadn't thought of that the first time. But in any case, these gals came. Uh, it was an intergenerational group. It was wonderful. It was a grandmother, her adult daughters, and her l little grandchildren. And they were so excited to be a part of this. It felt very, and then what happened is uh, members of our staff, one of whom is Chickasaw, came with her little girl. And it was just really a good feeling that like, this is how, this is how we, um, this is what matters to us. This is how we engage. This is how we meet, we'll share, um, open our hearts, give gifts. The children were fantastic. They were um, chaotic and um, delightful because everybody was a little bit nervous and they ran spinning around with their um, lay that Dow gave them and the candles, they were presenting them and you know, switching people's gifts and <laughs> making people laugh and it just felt so right because on the one hand, formal, yes, but what that really meant was just respect, taking the time and, and not being, um, yeah, just stopping to laugh and just take this time and have tea and eat something together it was it was incredibly beautiful the sharing that Maura and the whole team, you know, the whole Indigenous Roadshow provided their their acknowledgments, everybody's introductions and their own languages. And um, and going down to the beach. Mm -hmm. Went down to the beach and it was incredibly cold and hardly anybody was prepared for it, not even me. It was just white caps were flying and um, the sea was just really dark and um, there was a right at the bottom you know when you go down to this beach this little trail there was a vertical um, uh, log of driftwood um, where eagles often land on top of it but not that day although there were some eventually that kind of wheeled around over us that felt really good but everybody was just huddled there standing in the small circle and sharing some things like cornmeal and soil, and from different places, people came and, and just uh, just acknowledging the importance of this environment and this land, how it felt to be there all together. It felt really good. And uh, then we went back inside. <laughs> and that's an experience that will be different wherever you are. I mean, if you're in an urban environment, what does that mean for a native artist to come and visit and want to want to be able to? relate to the land somehow, mm -hmm. all things to think about. Protocol um, is a scary word, and it's like ally for some people. Um, a lot of Native people don't mind the, the militarism of that, you know, when you're fighting for survival, that, that allies actually not such a bad word. Um, but protocol can be scary, and it sort of feels like United Nations, but in, in a lot of ways, it is nation to nation. Um, so if be aware with Pacific Island, with, with uh, international visitors that very often in some places, I've, I've heard recently of, of a gathering where uh, someone, you know, they did the good work of bringing in someone from the local tribe to, to, to make a presentation and they essentially did kind of a welcome to land. And there was a Maori uh, person in the, in the audience. And as soon as that happened, that just set him into protocol mode uh, because culturally they have to respond. Mm -hmm. uh, also, if you get people from that from the Pacific, very often they are very uncomfortable about being there or starting any work without being welcomed. So it's like in the Pacific Northwest, there's a <coughs> canoe tradition where you don't land your canoe on someone else's land, sure, without being sung ashore, without being mm -hmm. welcomed. Those things can be very serious to international guests. So it's good to know if that starts happening. Um, apparently, the host didn't quite know what to do. You know, here's this guy in regalia in the audience that starts chanting, and um, uh, it was not what they expected. But that's what was required of those people to do with each other. So um, just be aware, aware that those that's sometimes what that means. Um, 
this is uh, uh, in the training we were also um, Sarah was the representative of the Ninilshit tribe was also there and so we wanted to, to do that uh, for her and with everyone else in the community to honor her uh, and so we did the same kind of protocol and gave her gifts at the training. Native artist residencies. We talked about cultural, cultural competency, we talked about community engagement protocol, and the next thing we did is sharing. So, if you want to talk about Nanwalik, and I'll just show a couple pictures here of what we did. We got in this little tiny plane. Yeah. <laughs> 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 That's the airport at Nanwalik. Literally, <laughs> literally 300 people in the village. And um, you'll see the, the, the tribal chairman here in a second. Um, they were tearing down a community house that was 20 years ago, served 100 people in the village, and now there are 300. They only are accessible by air, except they get, they get barges in the summer. So, um, so here we're, uh, we're introducing ourselves, a little protocol with the, so this is the chief. The chief in, in his um, grumpy. Disney grumpy sweatshirt. <laughs> uh, things are not always as they appear, folks. Uh, this is the community house. You see a lot of plywood in rural Alaska. It's being torn down to make room for more people. And we, these are awful pictures from my cell phone. Uh, we performed at the school. This is the entire school. Uh, kindergarten through high school. Mm -hmm. About, I don't know, 60 kids, something like that. Elders were there. Um, it was it was a, a complete community <coughs> event. Uh, we'll meet Arius later. He's a 18-year-old hip hop artist. Um, and there's Tao. And the the reason I kept this photo in is this is like this is the kind of community where um, if the clip on the microphone stand is broken. They're not going to get another one. They can't go to Costco. They're, they're not going to get anything to replace that until next summer. Mm -hmm. And so that's a, they found a pipe there and some clear tape, mm -hmm. and we made a microphone stand. <laughs> 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 there it is. Yeah. 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 Metal, metal, metal pipe in the back room. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and lastly, after the sharing, another important thing is food. So again, this is uh, a good picture of the food, not of the food. <laughs> um, Bonnell always does this, but in, if you're going to have native artists, they're, I guarantee you they're going to want to share food with the local community. Um, so do your best to arrange that kind of thing. Um, anyone want to talk about how hard that work is? I mean, well, I we, uh, we do these things and people will say, you know, I emailed the the tribe, and I never heard that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I knew that I really wanted it to be that tribe. I had brought um, a group there uh, the year before, Ryan Conero with Gary Upayak Beaver for Alaska and Alaska, and they loved it so much. And it was relatively spontaneous. It was one of those weather window days where we just went with about four days' notice, and it was fantastic. What made it so special is that Chief Kavasnikov, who's um, probably about my age, about 50, he and his, all of his siblings were um, sent off to boarding school, you know, and they mm -hmm. were, they were shamed um, and punished for speaking their language. And so, when we went to Nambalek, you know, and we, and we brought this play, Alakshka, which was about the juxtapositions and the white telling and the native telling of the story of place, he made sure that everybody in the community was there from the, from the pre-K to the elders who could, make it there on short notice and he talked about what it was like to go to boarding school and mm -hmm. he talked about and people talked about alcoholism they talked about intergenerational trauma and instead of ex for excluding the children his openness mm -hmm. and the children were like in the conversation like this they were like watching everything and they were hearing people talk about the challenges and the work of families and the trauma of families to deal with some I just I love this chief, you know. I wanted it to be this village because he is so busy and he is so engaged and he's so committed to like this um, open uh, dialogue. So in the end, with that little tiny weather window, we made it, we made it over there and um, we didn't have quite as much time for conversation. 
but that's okay. It's like in the long view of it, I think that I know that village is talking, mm -hmm. and um, that's what really matters. That's what really matters. They're not very accessible. They're protective, mm -hmm. actually. Yeah, I noticed that Mara had to sign a lot of autographs. It was, it was so cute. All the little girls went to Mara, and all the, all the high school boys went to Arius, who's a hip hop artist. <laughs> so, um, so the the as we said before, the the sort of the, the the proving agent, you know, the the experiment to like show showcase this this process is the Indigenous Roadshow that we're developing right now. And Mora is a cast member, and she's offered it talk a little bit about uh, that process and about what Native artists need in these kinds of situations. So yes, okay. Um, are you going to show things? Or yeah, oh yeah. yeah, so first, did you want to introduce folks? Oh, these pictures are awful. Yes. Look okay. at my well, computer, guys. Should we turn the lights on? Just try to help a little. Oh, <laughs> maybe <laughs> over there. Does that mess with HowlRound? No, it's just okay. a bad. It's well, a I, I, don't, I don't really. I'm, yeah. if, I don't want to see mine, so I'm gonna just look this way. Okay. okay. So um, <laughs> there's uh, there's four of us in the Indigenous Roadshow um, right now. There is Arius Hoyle, uh, who is um, doing it, and he is from Juneau, but currently lives in Seattle. He's a hip hop artist. Uh, he raps in his language and also in English, and a lot, you know does a lot of. <coughs> work that has to do with Alaska and his people and his community and, the, and talking about their traditions and life. Um, then there is, uh, okay, there's me, yes, mm -hmm. <laughs> all right, I already introduced myself. Mm -hmm. um, then there is Shelly Morningsong, uh, who is a, a beautiful singer. Um, she's Northern Cheyenne and she is um, just one of Indeed, a name for me in music Nanny. award. Yeah, she just won a Nanny for Best Artist mm -hmm. of the Year. She won two. I forgot the Best mm -hmm. Blues mm -hmm. Artist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, she is married to. Uh, oh, I forget his real hit. His kind of formal name is Fabian. That's true. We don't call him that. We have another name for him. But Fabian Fontanelle, who's Zuni in Omaha, and they are a couple. Uh, he is a traditional dancer, a storyteller, a singer, um, a comedian, mm -hmm. and. They have a wonderful, you know, relationship that they also bring to the, to the whole show, and yeah. So they both live on in Zuni Res in New Mexico, um, and ah uh, yes. And did you did you already talk about mm -hmm. Peter? Okay, Peter Tao. Um, we call him Tao, but Peter Rockford is Spiritu from Hawaii, um, and he is Samoan and Hawaiian, and he is our artistic director. He's marvelous. Um, he was wonderful to work with. So, and we didn't know each other before this process. I feel like I've known them for a long time now. But we had we just all met when we came to this residency. Mm -hmm. So, um, so, so I'll we don't have to follow slides. So you okay. Just yeah. No, I, I just <laughs> wanted to talk a little bit about uh, first talk about uh, the experience in the residency, and um, it was pretty amazing because I, I think you, you all actually almost did everything right. You know, so uh, I'll, when we got there, uh, we were allowed to do ceremony as we wanted to take however long we needed to take, you know, because we're all from literally many parts of the world. And, uh, the way that we created our protocol was we tried to incorporate some of everybody's, um, you know, and so there we have our own way of time, you know, and there was no rush to do things on a certain schedule. We were able to do it when we needed to have them done. So we were able to start with ceremony. Um, we had a really nice balance of being alone. As you know, Native artists, we were able to be alone and work alone. Uh, but when we needed other people there, they were there. You know? um, <clears throat> we had good food, which I'm kind of hungry now. And I'm thinking about all that food. We had you know, all kinds of fish that you can imagine, and moose, and berries, and you know, people really just brought out their heart, they cook heart food, they had heart food for us. Mm -hmm. they, you know, they cooked in their homes and they shared, um, you know, like uh, Asia was already saying, we were able to connect with, you know, local people there, you know, and 
talk with people, meet other, you know, other Native artists from that area. Um, I even got stuck there a day and ended up eating dinner with, um, you know, the, the, when she was talking about the grandmother, daughter, I, I ate dinner at their house, you know. <laughs> so, um, I, I really appreciated how they um, listened to us. They, I, people always say that world, you know, held space, that's what people always say that now, but I would say they made space an uplifted space for us, so. Um, and I appreciate it that sometimes when we were doing things, if it wasn't supposed to be photographed or it wasn't supposed to be recorded, you know, uh, we could request that it was not recorded. That's important for a lot of times. Not everything is supposed to be shared publicly. Um, we were allowed to, you know, s smoke out the area. We were, people were allowed to smudge. You know, that was not an issue at all. Um, we were allowed to have like an altar there. Um, and also that for me, you know, I live in town area, but I was raised out in the country. A lot of people live, some people live in rural areas, some people live in cities, but we had access to the ocean, we had, you know, the air, we had access to open air, to the land, um, and it was right there, which was really nice. It was a, a wonderful thing. Um, and I just wanted to contrast, I named the, I, I got to go to another residency somewhere else, along, you know, but I just remember that we were, in that residency, I was alone the whole time, and it was really depressing to be alone. I was the only Native person there, and it was like fielding a lot of annoying, kind of racist comments by uh, just weird questions, you know, by white people that were uh, a part of you know the residency or a part of the staff. So having contrasting that to what I had in Alaska it was just a wonderful experience. Um, so I think just that they were asked and they were asking people and listened and were open and then they said yes so that was I think that's kind of easy you just say yes <laughs> um, so uh, and then I also uh, wanted to share um, a little bit about you know what I as an artist would hope from a residency and then I have also uh, collected a few other native artists uh, their input because we don't really do things alone so I didn't want to be the only one speaking and I'll uh, not speak too long and then I'm going to also ask uh, my kinfolk here that have there's uh, three of you I spoke to before <laughs> that I warned you about this so yeah I'm going to ask you to talk a little bit about what you your residency experience so um, but from well, I'll just I'll just do it kind of like bullet point so this is coming from me uh, some of the things that I would hope that would be offered for other myself and other Native artists would be one money, um, meaning money for travel, money for lodging, money for per diem, money for ground transport, money as a stipend. Um, because a lot of times people either have to. I don't know where money comes from for people who go to residencies. I don't know how that happens. But uh, and if the residency program doesn't have the money, then su support locating and applying for funding. Uh, because that's not a lot of, you know, our artists may not have experience with that very strange process of finding funding. You know, it's just mysterious. So um, if not money, then help finding money. Um, I also put not to be alone, that we're allowed to bring family or our partners or our kids, um, that there's childcare for single parents. Um, a lot of us are single parents, um, that we're not the only Native person there, you know, that there are other Native people there, um, that we can connect with with local uh, other Native people, and if, if, if the local Native folks want, that we can work with them, uh, that we have the ability to connect with elders, with leaders, um, and then I put again, don't let, let's not be the only Native there, because that can be kind of distracting and painful from the work. Um, that's me speaking. Uh, then I have from Olivia Davies, who's uh, Ojibwe. She's based in Vancouver, BC. She's a dancer and choreographer, uh, an artistic director of Odella Arts, founder of Matrix Uprising, a contemporary indigenous female choreographer festival. Mm -hmm. She said, um, rather than looking at the effect of the problem, you know, the, the effect being where the touring native artist, she said, look at the root of the problem and she said uh, it would be important for organizations to get Native people as a voice embedded in your organizations mm -hmm. as opposed to tokenizing. Mm -hmm. So she said Nat Natives on committees, Natives on boards, 
on staff, leadership roles, ushers, everything you can think of, um, and that having Native people in those leadership roles helps to auto-correct the machine faster to ensure that Native uh, voices are already a part of everything that's going out. So when you hear, when you get an artist call, you know, if you're Native, you can tell, oh, is that, that's for me. That's, that's for me, it's not uh, for somebody else. Because sometimes you look at stuff and you think, oh, that's, that's not for me. Um, so uh, Ty Defoe, you know, of um, Indigenous Directions, who's based in New York, Oneida and Ojibwe, uh, interdisciplinary artist and performer and many, maker of many things. Um, he specifically had something to say about what the dream about getting space in New York City was. So this is, I think, pertinent to urban places. Um, he said, getting the space to create the work where one can move, uh, hang giant papers on the walls to sketch out what is in our minds, uh, to play music, to have natural light um, that fills both our soul and our perspective. Um, Shelley Morning Song, who also is Indigenous Roadshow, who wants, uh, she's Northern Cheyenne, as I said, and lives on the Zuni Res in New Mexico with her husband. Um, she said at the Bunel Residency um, that the, for her the whole I was like, oh, I thought it was. I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's from your phone. Oh, yeah, because I didn't turn it off. So. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know. Um, but, uh, oh, yeah, she said the whole thing of residency was, was new to both her and her husband. But the privacy together as we were working felt important. That's what she had to say, so that we were able to be, um, you know, just have Native folks by ourselves, not with other people, just for that time alone was very important. Um, and she liked the balance of having group workspace and then also having quiet, alone resting space so that you could sometimes be away from the group and create or meditate or rest. Um, Let's see, Mona Cliff, who's uh, Aanin, based in Lawrence, Kansas, um, who's a mixed media artist and master beater, said, uh, once again, she said, financing, biggest barrier to indigenous communities. Uh, she said, access, not enough art programs in rural areas, because sometimes it's daunting if you've got your family and whatever other responsibilities and, you know, to go off to somewhere halfway across the country for two weeks. Even if you do get funding, what are you going to do with everybody, you know, back home? So um, having more things in rural areas, um, helping funny people to find money to fund and make the process uh, easy. And she also echoed for residencies near native communities, like you all did, inviting community elders and knowledge keepers to be involved, um, and find ways to sustain engagement in the community after your artists are gone. So it's not just like, oh, uh, hi, new people, come on in, and then you forget about them. Um, and she said, also, it's daunting to be the only Native in some places. Uh, Brooke Smiley, who is a, uh, she's Osage, she's a dance earth and earth artist. She's based in California. She's also in an advancing indigenous performance program. She said, um, to be aware of and then let go of stereotypes of what an indigenous artist might create. <clears throat> um, research and get help about how to be open and how to become informed as allies and supporters. Um, opportunities that financially support artists in developing new work. And she talked about wanting support with audience connection, support with funders, you know, getting to know who the funders are and collectors, that's what she said. And I think that was um, all of my other people's uh, the feedback, you know, from the folks I collected. But then I also wanted to share the time um, with uh, James and Talon and Gunnar, if you like, just to talk about the, their experiences with residencies and there's, that there's also Native folks creating residencies. So. Um, I, can, I can start because I've never been on a residency. <laughs> So I'll take the least amount of time. Um, <laughs> so uh, just to introduce myself, my name is Gunnar Krogman. I go by Gunnar Jewel, which is my middle name. Um, I'm Shichangu Lakota from the Rose Basu tribe in South Dakota. So we're really out in the middle of nowhere, but I say the middle of everywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, we're mm -hmm. right in the middle of 
you know, with Plains Tribe and us, like Rosebud and Pine Ridge, you know, you know, there's seven tribes in South Dakota. Um, but ours is, so as far as residencies go, it's, um, my main thing is interesting hearing these things because those are all, that's kind of the space that we desire on the reservation. You know, we'd like to host and bring people in because we're, we're secluded just probably as much, not quite as much as Alaska. <laughs> but we, we, we really feel like it. I mean, especially when it comes to art and um, these things, that's like the vehicle to change and expression and um, really reaching the youth, you know, and just changing. Uh, I was talking earlier, we don't have a Lakota word for art. It's just a part of us and what we do. So um, just to, to have that space, you know, so experiencing a residency and things that I've had similar experiences just being in a professional um, space like that, you know, we, we really need that. You know, a lot of times we get, we don't have state-of-the-art art equipment because we go with the lowest bidder because we don't have, you know, so we're just really deprived of um, resources, equipment, you know, things. As, as an indigenous artist who grew up on the reservation, there's not zero exposure, no, um, no um, infrastructure for artists. So there's so, many, so much talent, you know, on, that never had the chance, opportunity. Like I had older relatives who are so great at what they do and I really looked up to those, but just they, they didn't have the opportunity to make that a career. And a lot of the people even from Rosebud who I've met who become successful, I've never heard of them because they had to go find their success somewhere else. So for me, I'd be able to create a space like that on the reservation, then, you know, bring people to us and have, we could bring, you know, organizers or people, you know, who are doing some of the work and indigenous, non-indigenous, but just with the same values and um, be able to create there at home would be, that's like my ultimate dream. Mm -hmm. And that's actually that happening. Uh, Laurie's not here, but uh, First Peoples Fund has a project where they're, with art space where they're building a, a, a place in Kyle. Will that be a residency? Yeah, there will yeah. be, um, I think, five arts businesses that mm -hmm. can, and there will be a recording studio there. But, I mean, Pine Ridge is the size of, was it Kentucky? Yeah. Like, key, and we're talking about Rosebud being like in the center of the state, so it's still quite a distance yeah. away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I, sorry, that just chimes something that I just want to share right now. I'm member of the Way, and I'm Ramos Wichi, and I'm Kenny Ramos, I'm from the Brona Band of Mission Indians. I grew up and live on the Brona Indian Reservation. I'm a theater artist and part of First Peoples Fund. But um, I love what Gunnar's talking about, because, like, and I don't know if this is relevant here for talking about residencies, but, like, we were talking about as Native people being so grounded in our communities and who we are and loving that. And, like, how could, is there, like, a, some type of structure where an organization that already has a residency, I mean, I guess that's the point of it, how you have to be in residence there, but could, is there ability to sponsor indigenous people to make art at home for that to be a residency and for support from that to come from somewhere else? Um, like how can the residency be really catered to what the indigenous artist needs? Because for me, I know I, it's about being, I mean, I'm connected to my people and my culture and my land, and that is kind of first and foremost. And I travel a lot for work, which I love, but I, I rarely get to actually work at home mm -hmm. um, within my community. And it can, how can a residency come that's like sponsored by this organization, but really to the point of like, well, we, look, we, we want to support you so much where we want to put you in residence, and if that means you being over there, then like, we'll sponsor you to be in residence in your residence and do what you, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, anyway, anyway, just I just want to say, you can actually apply as an artist for the NPN Creation Fund, which mm. is yeah. coming up right now. Mm. And mm. you that and that what happens is you get you get a tour that you can actually create that work in your own community. Oh, okay, fascinating. So you so so you know as a, as a creative uh, as a creation fund artist, you get to create in your own place, mm. but you get three national uh, organizations to support you. Okay. Well, uh, is it say, say it's the me. same thing that uh, Ed is oh, doing uh, the creation fund, the NPA creation fund, oh, okay. that allows you. you to do that. Yeah. Cool. You can <laughs> apply you. as an individual <laughs> artist. But I like the idea of the residency delivery service. I hate to cut off the conversation, yeah. but, but, I just wanted to but, but we wanted to yeah, uh, let Aaron have an opportunity mm -hmm. to 
we've only got 10 minutes left. Oh. So we want to give Aaron an opportunity to talk about what are sort of next steps. If we, you know, we, we talked about uh, things that we're doing now. The Indigenous Roadshow, just so you know, has five co-commissioners. Uh, Bunnell, Putney Foundation, Maui Arts and Cultural Center in, in uh, Hawaii, Pangaea World Theater, Bunker, <coughs> and the International Sonoran Desert Alliance in Ajo. You should know about them. They're awesome. They go here across the border. Um, what does it mean to be a good ally? This, we wanted to we wanted to give uh, Aaron and Pika an opportunity to talk about how they're addressing this. Thank you. I am absolutely, I think it's absolutely appropriate for me to take the shortest amount of time and to mostly listen as an ally or whatever we want to call it, a friend, a fit, an accomplice. Um, uh, and what I wanted to share is um, actually we've been asked this question a couple of times to kind of assess where we are and where we're going. Um, and this, um, what I just wanted to read to you was um, something that was posted to Demian Daniyaji's Instagram, and Demian's an artist we've worked with many times and put out this question to say, so you allies who are doing land acknowledgements, what else are you doing? <laughs> um, and our um, colleague, uh, Roya Amir Soleimani, who's great, maybe some of you have met her, um, wrote this response, um, and then we took it and kind of have been using it as a starting point for a check-in on where we are and what we're doing. Um, and um, apparently it's been helpful to other people who want to move forward in this work, so I'll share it with you, acknowledging that a lot of you are further um, in this work than we are. Um, so the first um, thing, the first set is kind of what, where are we now? What have we already been doing? Um, one, an individual and organizational consciousness shift, awareness and acknowledgement, and a commitment to prioritize indigenous artists and communities in our research, curation, and community engagement efforts. Um, and I have to acknowledge also that that has really been catalyzed by Emily Johnson and work that we did um, with her as an artist and also as the, um, um, the leader of the First Nations Dialogues and Global First Nations Performance Network that we've been involved with, with for about three years. Um, we do land acknowledgement statements before every public event, printed statements in our programs and lobby. I think that that's just like baseline now. Um, get there. If you're not there, there's lots of resources to help you. Um, we are ensuring indigenous artists are represented in our TBA <coughs> festival year-round programming, residencies, and grant funding with emphasis on queer, trans, women, two-spirit, gender non-conforming and non-binary people. That's just an extension of the work we were already doing in um, queer, um, as a queer feminist organization. Um, we don't have a quota for this, but roughly about 10% of our artistic budget is a goal for us. Um, and we've been doing for about the past two years and we're planning to continue that. Um, working to expand and strengthen trusted relationships with indigenous artists, communities, and groups ensuring there is indigenous representation on our staff. There is, but there should be more. Participating actively in helping to provide fiscal sponsorship and resources for GFNPN. We're the fiscal sponsor and kind of incubator for that network, sharing whatever resources we have. Um, calling other ally partners in that effort in when needed and attempting to relieve indigenous folks of always having to do that labor. Um, providing admin labor where we can, reading and discussing texts on decolonization politics and practices, incorporating decolonization and specific consideration of indigeneity in our ongoing racial equity plan, regularly turning over our physical and material space, time and resources to black indigenous um, POC plus artists, making connections between local, national and international artists and curators and supporting artist led exchanges and supporting indigenous curated programming. So that's, where, that's what we're doing, um, where we are going. Um, grow and ensure indigenous representation, inclusion and retention on our board and staff. Work to ensure our work and office culture feel as safe as possible for indigenous folks. Build tr trusted relationships and conversations with local and regional elders, tribes and indigenous communities, not just individual artists, which is frankly, where we are now, all of our relationships are one-to-one -one, um, 
case, you know, individual artists, because that's always been our practice. Um, repair past relationships and actively acknowledge the colonizing roots and forces of the nonprofit industrial complex mm -hmm. and work to subvert, upend, and decolonize with the understanding that reparations and decolonization of space, mind, and culture is lifelong and imperfect work. Seek indigenous folks' input, advice, participation along the way with financial compensation. Embed policies, values, and protocols in the organizational fabric. So this work will be carried out consistently in all areas, staff, board, volunteers, production, and continue to evolve through changes in leadership. And then the question what was asked, that was asked to us was what would we find difficult to commit to? And we changed it to say we are committed to doing these things, but we have challenges with these things. Um, prioritizing indigenous artists, first peoples first when other marginalized and oppressed people in our community are also struggling for resources, striving to be intersectional in this work, and our understanding of intersectional is that centering black and specifically black femme people, but in our community it also means a lot of other kinds of people. Um, building trust with local indigenous elders communities given the range of work we support, including queer transgressive voices and experimental aesthetics, um, that might be actually a miss or a kind of an assumption on our part that the elders might not be open to the kind of work that we've shown, but we actually haven't tested that yet, so that might just be um, a, a mindset problem on our yeah. part. Um, let's see, building capacity for program staff and board positions so we can recruit and in retain indigenous individuals and compensate them equitably. Many staff um, begin as volunteers and board is, un are, is unpaid. So how can we improve working conditions so that um, those roles are ones that we could equi you know, equitably <laughs> ask people to do? Um, building capacity for commissioning residencies and developments. We can support artists through the whole life of their work. And this one, we keep coming back to this one, which I'm realizing is more of like maybe um, a mindset issue than an actual issue um, that um, many uh, on the land where we are on um, the Chinook, Multnomah, and Clackamas land most of the people of that land were either killed or forcibly removed and so um, our urban population represents uh, 380 different um, tribal affiliations and it's about 70,000 people so how do we find the right people um, mm -hmm. to go to as elders? Um, and there is some hesitation on our part of not wanting to do the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. And now that I look back, I can see that that's um, been a big mistake of ours, of like not um, trying because we weren't sure the right path mm -hmm. and actually listening to a lot of people today. And I was thinking about like mm -hmm. some things like, oh yeah, I could have asked you know, instead of waiting. But um, anyway, if that's where we are, I hope that's helpful. Mm -hmm. to are, is stuff. all that um, public, like, available? Yeah, we're actually working on publishing it right now. So, um, yeah, we're happy to make that um, public, and it's been circulated on Instagram, so. Mm -hmm. On what, on Instagram? On Instagram, on our artist on page. But, oh. um, no, we're working on, on publishing it through um, Emily. And I don't know. Um, we just don't have really any time left in the session, but I wanted to, you know, maybe just super briefly say what the GFNPN is in case people mm -hmm. don't already know. Do you, would you want to, um, so, um, you should. It, it, uh, it is in <laughs> process, as everything is. Um, Ed is on the advisory uh, group with myself and Linda McKinney and uh, Lori Poirier and Blair Gantner. Um, and we work with colleagues, uh, uh, First Nations leaders and artists currently in what is called Canada, New Zealand, Australia, and the US um, to build a global network that will support the commissioning and touring and presenting of our First Nations performing artists in the way that we want to make and present work. So a lot of the things touched on, like where do we want to work? If you want to work rurally, how do we support that? If you want to work urban, how do we support that? If you want to tour globally, how do we support that? If you want to just stay home, how do we support that? And doing that work with 
um, presenters who are indigenous and also um, presenters who are not indigenous. And then a lot of that work, as Aaron just uh, very beautifully laid out in this document, is a lot of decolonization and indigenization work with our partner organizations. And all of that in an effort to not only build this network, but I think overall to shift the consciousness um, um, and to really center indigenous people and indigenous voices and story. Are there any questions? We're, we're at time. I, but I had a question. Yeah, please. Uh, how many, can I just ask him just briefly to tell, because I Yeah, I, I didn't mean to, hear, to cut that yeah. off. And is it, is just to let everyone know the session yeah. is is at time, but yeah. it, I'm willing to yeah, just, as long just as briefly talk want. about the, the native residency that you yeah. created. Yeah. Um Mr. Kanshu James Pakotis, um, owner and operator of DCM Collective, Dream Chasers Music Collective. It's a recording studio that uh, First Peoples Fund and a native CD, CDFI from my community um, helped me get grants so that I could, I could, it was specifically just to be an artist and do my own project. But when I approached them, I said, you know, I, I need to build an infrastructure so I can do 50 projects. One's not going to be enough for me because I don't have the resources where I'm from. So I took it on myself to kind of be, to do the, the, the work as not, an, not of an artist, but to produce for other artists. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, was approached by First Peoples Fund mm -hmm. through a grant that they won. And uh, Talon Doshino here uh, was our very first artist in residence. Mm -hmm. And I've only released, like my first, I'm an artist myself, I only released my first, my first song, you know, a year ago. So I'm very early in this, but um, have a very smart business acumen. So um, I went to Arts Northwest, and it was my first booking conference ever last year. And I went and I felt vastly unprepared. Mm -hmm. um, I'm an artist, I've got work, but I didn't have a nice website. I didn't have a, a, a very good press kit. So the first thing I asked Helen when he showed up, I was like, hey, how's your press kit looking? How can we help with that? So as far as needs of what, of what artists needs in, in residence, you know, they're gonna need press kits because it's not enough mm -hmm. to just get them to the conference. They need to be prepared when they're there. Mm -hmm. You know, so they need press kits. And, and we only had four days with them. And in four days, it was building community. I brought my goddaughter in, she braided our hair, she cooked for the whole week. We went to the store, we got massive amounts of groceries. So anybody that stepped in that space, she was gonna cook as well, but we also had everything to where it didn't matter at what time of day, because we recorded from nine in the morning until 4 a.m. We had four days, and in four days, we brought in 16 separate artists, four different producers, three different camera crews, and we recorded 22 songs. You know what I'm saying? So um, it was, and this is our first experience doing anything like this, but it was like, for me, the whole space is created for artistry and, artistry and creation. So with that, it's a, I've got a five bedroom house that I renovated the whole basement into a studio. So I've got professional acoustics, I've got professional hardware, professional software, you know, even a computer that I built from scratch, just so we could have like all of the professional resources that we don't have in that area. Like I am the source of that now. So for me, it's about career development. You know, it's not just enough to make the art anymore in, in today's world. Like we've got to we've got to know marketing. We've got to know how to how to mix and master and track ourselves. You know, Gunner, me, and Talent take that on ourselves as well because we're self-producing at this point. You know, a lot of the artists that we that we see and we and we and we and we mesh with are, are emerging artists. You know, not all of us are professionals. So, for me in my area, it's it's my goal and, and my passion to raise the bar of artistry in my area. So we do workshops of of, of mixing techniques. You know, how to use an equalizer. You know, the, the proper way. How to use a condenser. And in what ways do you pair these to bring your mix to a higher level? You know, we teach them about press kits and how do you get how do you get a one sheet looking really nice? You know, what what, what is in an artist statement? And, you know, First Peoples Fund made me a certified trainer in their NAPD trainings where they go th through a whole spectrum of visual arts, performance art, doesn't matter, whole career development. So I'm bringing that knowledge and experience that they gave with me to other artists in my area. So for me, it was, it was that, that, that building of community, you know, bringing all these people in. It wasn't just about him being an outside artist, it was him bringing him to, to the fold of our network that we've, that, that, that we've established in Spokane, Washington, you know. He came all the way across the country, he didn't know anybody. We had, we had natives, we had black, Mexican, Asian, white people, white producers, you know, it was like a, a, a mix of races so that we could tear down these walls. And then, you know, his whole story was, was the whole album was about Iktomi traveling the multiverse, you know, and it was about a trickster and, 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 and a story that goes with his 
like with his people, like he told me it's specific to his people, and, and for us, it's Coyote and other tricks here, but it was mingling of that, and how do, how do these tribal um, belief systems and spirituality, how do they transcend that, because these type of belief systems and stories are in every one of our races, these types of characters are in every one of our races, you know, so it was like, hearing that perspective and that lens and yeah there was a little bit of education of the people that were non-tribal into what this is and what is this what is this spirit what is this belief system why is it important to us and why does it matter to you and how can you shed light on that from your perspective and your lens without us controlling your voice mm -hmm. but still lifting up his his belief system behind what he wanted to what he wanted to achieve you know so it was a, it was a beautiful process and uh, and the biggest thing that, that I think that we need as artists going in is, is definitely finances. You know, we even had a good, a, a, a good amount of a grant, but still reinvesting that into all the food, you know, hiring a cook, you know, we had three camera crews, so we had photography, videography, shooting the whole thing. So it was, it's an investment to do all that. And plus having to pay the artists and the producers. Now we're talking about, wow, we did like over 40 hours of just tracking, just tracking, you know what I'm saying? And then there's mixing, and then there's mastering. You know, so there's all of these hours that we got to give an audio engineer, you know, and then so there's there's finances go go deep really quickly. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that money that we got, we re we reinvested the whole thing except for maybe like a thousand dollars just to pay different people. You know, the rest of it was reinvesting into services. So especially in a residency too, that that press kit stuff, it's like we wanted everyone to walk away with pictures and video for their own social media, for their own websites, all of us involved can benefit and be lifted from a residency like this. I don't care if you walk in, my, my goddaughter's got professional photos of her, you know, braiding hair and cooking and stuff that she can just, she can use on posts and her fact, it doesn't have to be business, you know, this is like building of community, you know, so there's a lot that goes into it, you know, but that's from my aspect, being an artist, but being kind of, I wouldn't say thrown, but I volunteered to, to step in and do it, to produce the, the residency, and uh, it was it was it was intense, but um, artists artists come first, you know. He, he 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 really came to work, and we were really proud to, to work with him. So, so that's all I really have to say about this. Awesome. Sure. It's land based. Sorry, am I jumping here? <laughs> land based, but you created it in where you were, like land in your community. Anyway, I just think it ties back. Sorry, <laughs> land based. Watch out in the land, everybody. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, land based, but like in that way, where we're connected. Kind of it wasn't even my ancestral land because I come from the Caldwell tribes. And when I got that grant, and I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a staple in my community, I'm a leader in my community, but we have like four different reservations that, that need these type of resources. Mm -hmm. So I used that money to go get, go, go get a house in the city away from my people that was more centralized to all four reservations. Mm -hmm. So now we're bringing in elements and I'm bringing in sources from each one, you know, and, and each one of us matter because a lot of us are, we're only an hour or two away from each other. So where are you? Um, in Washington, Washington State, in Spokane, Washington. So we've got the Coeur d'Alene, the Spokane, the Kalispell, and the Colville, right, all right there. And a lot of us have family in all of them, because we, I mean, you know what I'm saying? We're, we're nomads, so we traveled and, and, and traded with each other, so we've got a lot of familial ties. So tying in these cultural ties and different culture, like you said, we all got different practices and stuff. And beliefs. That was another thing, we had spirituality, we had community, we had youth, we brought in two 17-year-olds and two 19-year-olds to bring in culture and show them that they could do be like my 15 year old nephew came in and, and did like two verses you know mm -hmm. my nephew who's a producer only been making beats for eight months like brought in and like now he's like he's crazy about music you know <laughs> just from being in that space of, of community and then the ones from my studio yeah oh yeah we talked a little bit about that yeah, uh, here's uh, our artist in residence right here uh, hello <laughs> <laughs> um, from Lakota and Dakota I'm from the Crow Creek, uh, Dakota Res, and the Cheyenne River, Lakota Res. I get mixed up because I'm always, it's in, it, it's by nature you want to say Sioux, but that's more a derogatory term for us. It means like lesser snake. Um, in Ojibwe, who we used to have issues, but we're already. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 but, uh, um, bigger fish to fry. <laughs> There was, uh, from my perspective, so I, just to put it out there first and foremost, because I'm not like every, uh, every other artist is different, right? But one major thing about me is I don't, uh, and this isn't for a moral compass or a status or anything, 
I really don't care about money. And I really don't care about fame. Which is weird, because I'm an artist. And that's the only way we can kind of live. <laughs> but I don't care about those things. And I, that's how I live my life. Uh, I live my life for my family and for my people there. And that means that even right now, I feel bad sitting on this chair. I really do this whole time. But I didn't want to disrupt and get up and move around or anything and have someone convinced to take my seat for me. I, but it's that deep for me. And where I'm at, I work 20 hours a week as a trio advisor, uh, mainly because I like to be around the 6th to 12th graders. And since I meet with them so infrequently, I can teach them about anything I want. Um, I can bring in AIM, I can bring in civil rights, I can teach it all through ethnomusicology, I can teach it through my experiences at the residency, um, and share those things constantly with them, but it means that I struggle, and, and, and even though I'm an established artist, I've made over 10 self-produced albums, one of them is 51 tracks long, um, I, I, I really do love this thing because it's what saved me. And so a big portion of, in my perspective, when Amber uh, approached me with this offer from, I don't want to misname the grant, uh, the USDA slash... Rural business something? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when I was approached with that grant, my initial thought was because we had hit it off so well in Phoenix, we, we made a song with Gunner. Um, that released like on Spotify just released so two weeks ago. Check it out. Um, we had hit it off so well in Phoenix that you know our first uh, we're talking like you know I need to come out to you guys or you guys need to come out to me vice versa. My initial thought went there, and so two big forms of trust had to come uh, from Amber for me, which was one, which was the. I'm not the artist that's going to be pushing for money and fame and stuff, which may not sound great to a lot of funders because it's an investment for some of them and they want something back from that. Mm -hmm. Me, as the kind of artist that I am, I can't guarantee that all the time. We can say that, that yeah, that we all believe in that, but we all need to live. And this is the world that we're in, unfortunately. And it's one that I'm reminded of every time I leave my rest and every time that I'm in it. Um, I needed that, that trust from Amber, when, and that was clear when she first approached me. The second was uh, to, um, you know, picking James and choosing him. There was never an issue of, are you sure James can do that? Are, are we sure he's capable? Are we sure he's qualified? A lot of other, I've, I'm a University of Penn alum. I'm very familiar with the Ivy League. <coughs> uh, for for uh, reference, that's where Trump went. <laughs> <laughs> so, because not everybody knows that. That's where I went. So I'm very familiar with exploitation. I'm very familiar with tokenism. I'm very familiar with people asking you to do something but not believing you can do it. Can you speak for us? Well, are you sure you know how to present? Mm -hmm. That sort of thing. Mm -hmm. I needed that trust from Amber to keep this water clear. And from James, I needed that same amount of trust, which I'm not used to, creatively. Um, I realized that through this residency, the main thing I always wanted to do in hip hop was not, I really wanted to be a good rapper and a good beat maker, and these things developed over time, but more than anything I wanted to be a hip-hop composer I wanted to be able to compose an album where it's not just me because if it's just me e even I'm gonna turn it off you know mm -hmm. and and this ask this the thought that I had because James had asked me you know what's your goal here like what do you want and I said well I want to do an album with you guys with uh, and with my people so that way we're all in it and I'm thinking, well, what does that look like? What's the narrative for that album then? Because we can't just throw songs together. You know, it, it has to be something. And my thought went to, well, for some reason I thought of this title, Traveling the Multiverse with Iktomi. Mm -hmm. Iktomi is the, the trickster spider spirit who teaches us everything not to do. 
But personally, I don't like the way that he's depicted as an evil being. You know, we're always laughing at Ikdomi. We're always pointing at Ikdomi. When in reality, he lives a hard life and the people that he infect, or the people that he affects um, live hard lives, for at least for that moment. And those are powerful because that's a sacrifice to teach us something. The people who are doing things wrong out there are teaching us how to do it right. A long time ago when I was 12, my dad looked at me in the eye and he said, son, I'm teaching you everything not to do. And he guzzled. I was 12. And now that I'm 26, he talked to me the other month. And he said, you know, I don't know why I told you that. I don't know why I did that because he's, he's since recovered. And I said, Dad, you know, it's weird, but that made me who I am in a weird way. I'm not mad at that. You know, and we get along since. And this is the guy who I had my first fist fight with, you know, attempted whatever on. And you see, know, it is it's the reservation. It was a rough life, but a good life. And. I wanted to paint this picture of Iktomi showing not just, you know, the negative and exploiting the poverty and the struggle and everything and creating a hopeless aspect, but rather showing the power through Iktomi and showing the lessons that we can learn, the things that we can learn from, the mistakes, and for us to heal and be like, okay, none of us are perfect. We all know these feelings, which is why it's a narrative album but for the most part everything is more or less an emotion and experience that is different for us and that's where the multiverse comes in the, for me the indigenous experience and the human experience is one of a multiverse mm -hmm. we're all walking with a different perspective experiences memories uh, uh, hereditary memories and, uh, and generational memories and memories that we're still remembering they say when you make a song you're just remembering it Mm. And, and so in, in my thought oh, when I approached James with it I was like I want to call it this and when I said that I expected him to laugh or be like you know you're crazy or whatever I even presented it as a joke mm -hmm. because on the air that's what we do like when we think someone's going to dog on us we're just like yeah I was messing around <laughs> <laughs> and, but he was straight up you know that sounds awesome let's do that and I was like alright and so that amount of trust was really, really needed because then when I got to um, be there, a great amount of respect and open-mindedness came with that based off of this, this topic of the album. And it took a lot of bravery for James to come and sit down with me, even though we had already kind of had this general understanding of the album concept. And he sat down and he said, I really kind of want to know more about Iktomi. And am I wrong in saying that, you know, Sinclair is our version of him? Mm -hmm. So we sat down and we talked in that studio for a while while everybody else was outside. And I loved that because being open, I think, you, I, we're not expecting, you know, any non-native to know the ins and outs of us and come to us and kind of give us this, uh, um, this like, uh, proof that they know, oh. and, you know, because we're just hearing it again. Rather, I enjoy the bravery that some people have to say, I want to know more about this thing. Mm -hmm. I want, uh, I don't know enough, or I feel like I just need to understand a bit more. I understand this much, but can you tell me a little bit more so I can help, you know, figure out this, this aura that we're going for? Mm -hmm. So there was that. And then that open-mindedness uh, and access to his his network there really opened the doors for me to learn how to be that composer that I was mentioning before. Um, seeing how he interacts with his young people, because back where I'm at, apart from the trio, I run a, a twice a week uh, open studio for the community where anybody can come in and record anything. Stories, teachings, rap, rock, uh, powwow, hand drum, traditional, contemporary, anything. And part of the issue that I was facing for a while was, you know, how do I uh, maintain a free and open space to creativity while, you know, especially in the, in the medium of rap, 
giving a little reality checks to some of the younger ones who might be popping off and saying a little bit too much and maybe causing more divisiveness than togetherness. Mm -hmm. But not, you know, telling them you can't say this, you can't say that, because I'm not about censorship either. He showed me a way to do that. Uh, and, the, and the thing was, is, you know, I got to use it this last week. Um, a young 15-year-old came in and he was recording and he said the N-word like five times. He's native. And I said, okay, bro, I, I paused it and I remembered what James did. And I, so I just looked at him and I said, I just want you to answer me this question. And I'm not, I, this, you don't have to change anything, but I'm going to ask you this. Are you prepared to stand in front of a black person and defend your right to say that word? And this person is not going to be professional with you. This person is not <laughs> going to be nice. This person might come from a struggle worse than yours and maybe twice your size. Are you prepared to look up to that person <laughs> and tell them, I can say this? And he was like, yeah, I kind of figured this would kind of <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, you know, native is the same amount of syllables. And he's like, okay. And that's what I learned from seeing him do it there. But also, it helped me be a composer in the sense of, I was talking with a couple of people this last night, um, I admire people like Scorsese and, and other composers that are in music and outside of music. Scorsese can go to actors like uh, the, you know, this recent Irishman that just came out and tell them what he wants, but still have that open space for them to put their own identity in it and their own improvisation, ideals, values, create it, their own character that's off of what he wanted to fulfill this larger piece. I, as a composer, can't tell a rap artist, yeah, you know, feel free to, you know, do whatever you feel will work best for the song. I can't say that to them. Because then what they're hearing is, oh, a talent don't really care too much about this song. I can just kind of do whatever. <coughs> and as, but I learned that I could be like, well, this is the thing. And I explain the multiverse and this and that. I want you to bring your universe into this topic. Mm -hmm. So anything you say, I'm not going to be offended by. I'm not going to question. Maybe some, um, maybe we'll talk later, but for now, I want you to bring your full you. And because of that, you know, we have 22 songs, and I know <coughs> albums, they'll have filler songs in them. This is, the, everything contributes to the narrative and has something special in it to where, like, I was on the plane over here going through, like, organizing the first uh, order of the songs and just, like, in tears because I finally made something that, to for me, was what I've always wanted, you know, musically. And I think a big part of that and what should be considered with a lot of Native artists is, you know, I can, you know, go five days, throw me in, in for five days and I'll make my best work. If I'm just focused on that, things are taken care of. And even the food, I appreciated that about the food because in my culture, our belief with food is that whoever prepares it, whatever spirit they're carrying, that's going into the food, and that's what you're ingesting. You know, a food could, uh, a meal could be completely greasy, but depending on the spirit that you have behind it, you'll, gee, you'll eat it and then you'll be. Uh, if I'm making a burrito, I'm just like, there you go. <laughs> that person's gonna feel that energy from me, and, and they're gonna ingest it, and that's gonna be in their soul for however long. For me, you know, we're eating good food, but more importantly my spirit felt at peace to where I could, uh, it was literally, I would be downstairs, punch in my verses, go upstairs, someone's making a beat, I write to that beat, come down, hey, they made that beat, can I record it real quick and get so-and-so on here, so-and-so comes down, they hear me record, okay, bro, here's what I want you to do, you hear this, I'm going for this vibe, you know, you ever have this happen to you, and I'm like, yeah, I have, and then they start writing, and I'm like, cool, I'm going to go outside and get some medication and come back in and do my other part. It was like that constant, constant, constant. And that's how we ended up doing you know, those songs in that time. And I, I don't mean to brag by saying it's like I'm so proud of what we did. And, you know, there's like one or two songs that I'm not on at all. And there's, you know, production that I'm not involved in at all. But it fulfills the vision that I had because everybody was on the same page. 
even people who are just there for like an hour. <coughs> and um, so when we're approaching different native artists, I think it does need to be realized that not necessarily, you know, poverty for poverty's sake, but even people like me, I have a job. I help take care of my mom. I help take care of my little brother. Um, I'm not, I struggle, but I'm not, you know, I, for the most part, I, br I either break even or I'm lesser than, you know, that's my mode in life. And I don't keep anything. But, and so I, when people kind of expect me to cover things, it really puts me in like an ugly mode because I don't want to complain. I don't want to say I need something. And even as far as the food, you know, James was very hospitable and for Dakota people that's really important because you almost have to force us to take something from your home or to even sit and he made me feel comfortable and there's something to be said about that and entrusting uh, those types of positions to people like me and James mm -hmm. where you know mm -hmm. no one questioned his ability it partially done it before and partially because even though he's never done it before, he's really good at it. Um, but I think, in part, you know, our whatever success came out of this came from that trust and respect and open mindedness from everybody, especially even from you know Amber's position, and she wasn't there with us; she was coordinating it. And the way she approached me about it, if anybody else did, I might have hesitated. Even you know. That, that though it's an opportunity, I might have hesitated because I've had so many bad experiences before. Mm -hmm. But someone like Amber, who already has this relationship with me, um, you know, we talk and, and she asks, you know, updates and things like that and make sure things are good. Um, things like that, it, where I'm from in my family in our small res of Crow Creek, one of the seven in South Dakota, um, that's huge for us, it, you know, and I'm sure for a lot of other natives and non-natives too, um, especially for artists, if you're looking for a piece that really has meaning and value in it, you know, those, somehow those worries of finance gotta be, because I think those values go beyond it. Cool. They go beyond means to where, you know, we could have had nothing and we would have been fine. But the fact that we had all that stuff made it even more productive. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I'm, I'm performing in the Artist Time Friday. I'm going to do one of the songs that we made there to okay. show people. Um, so, I, yeah, but that's all I really have to share. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.